Mark chapter 6, please. Mark chapter 6, moving right along. <laughs> yeah. Moving right along. I love being in uh, this, this book of Mark together. Um, keeps us focused, keep us, keeps us centered on the person of Jesus. And uh, here we're going to experience a little disappointment, and we're going to experience a scandalous uh, a, uh, measure of offense that we would only connect to something scandalous happening uh, in, our, in our life or in our culture. Um, it seems like scandals all over the place. Doesn't it feel like scandals all over the place? It's constantly in politics. It's in politics. It's in uh, the business world. It just seems like there's scandal in the church. There's scandal. It's scandalous, man. Some, there was even a show called Scandal. They did a whole show around the around Kerry Washington, I think. Wasn't that the Olivia Pope? Olivia Pope. <laughs> hope. That's right, scandal. So there, there's going to be that in this narrative as well. It'll be Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. And um, you know what this story kind of reminded me, or this narrative, this historical narrative, kind of reminded me of that, uh, remember that movie Rudy? Did any of y'all watch Rudy? If you, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm looking at faces that have not seen Rudy. Raise your hand if you've seen Rudy. I don't want to. Oh, my goodness gracious. This. No, not Fat Albert. Not not the Cosby show. Not not Rudy Huxtable. I, I'm talking about the movie, the classic movie Rudy. Yeah, Rudy. Now, hold on. Just just for a point of reference, because now I got to think about. Now I got to think about now I got to think about how much I got to explain the movie. So just one more time. Can you put your hands up if you've seen the movie Rudy? Rudy is a movie about a young man from a steel town whose dream is to play for uh, Notre Dame, to play football for the school of Notre Dame, the fighting Irish. Right. And so his whole dream is to play football for Notre Dame. Now, the only problem is, is that Rudy Rudiger was his name, Rudy Rudiger. True story, true story. Um, I actually met Rudy at Towson University. He was speaking. My dad brought me, and I heard his story. I just heard his story. I got to shake his hand and meet him. I was young, probably like 10 years old or so. But it's about this young man named Rudy Rudiger who is in a steel town. He comes from a family that loves Notre Dame football. Like, it's just, they're all around the TV. They sit there. Rudy has to, like, change the channel. It's like this old TV set. This is old school. And he grows up in this town around this family. And I remember uh, they're sitting down and they're, they're talking. I think they're at the dinner table. And Rudy goes, I'm going to play for Notre Dame one day. And his dad, like, busts out laughing. His older brother starts laughing. They, they're like, you're too small. And they start making jokes it's like, yeah, one day I'll be the pope and like all this stuff. And so Rudy, he's not very good at school. He, he's like terribly, he, he's not, uh, he's got ADHD. I think he's got dyslexia that he's dealing with and he's not doing very well in school. And so like even at school, um, the principal of the school is telling him, hey, you can't make it. He wasn't even, wasn't even allowed on the field trip to go to the college, to even look at the guy. He was not even allowed to go on the field trip because while he's in line to get on the bus to go visit Notre Dame, which he's been dreaming about his whole life, the principal, who's like this, you know, has a priest collar on. He's like, hey, Rudy, listen, um, I don't think this trip is for you. And he's like, well, maybe I can go there one day. And the priest was like, I don't think so. And so the bus takes off and leaves him behind. And then he goes to this, um, you know, smaller school, this community type school, uh, community college type school. And he's just wants to work so he can get the grades to go to Notre Dame and be on the, the football team. And he's small. And he comes from this know-nothing town, and his whole family's against him, and his brother's laughing at him, and his dad's making fun of him, and nobody thinks he can do it. And then he finally makes it to Notre Dame, and he's on the practice squad for four years, just busting his tail, busting his tail to one day dress to be on the field with the fighting Irish, to run out of that tunnel. And he keeps telling his family this whole time that he's in college, he's like, I'm on the practice squad for Notre Dame. And they don't believe him. 
They, they don't even believe him. And, and he's like, the coach said that I can dress for the football game. And they don't believe him. And, and then, like, finally he gets to the point where he's able to be in the game. And he's on, spoiler alert for you guys. Uh, where he's, and, and then his family is still like, I don't believe you, <laughs> you know? And so it's like this whole thing where he sees so much potential in himself but nobody around him is believing what he believes about himself, what he's called to do, what he's called to accomplish, how he's supposed to be on that team, how he's meant to fulfill this, this purpose in his life. The only person that believes in him is his best friend, and a tragedy happens and takes him out of his life. It was the only guy who believed in him. But he kept going, he kept moving to accomplish his dream. I'm not going to tell you how it ends or what, but you should see the movie because the movie is amazing. It's an amazing story. So see the movie Rudy, all right? It's, it's epic. Rudy, all right? Just see it. All right, don't look at me. Like, nod your head. Luke, I'm going to see it. I'm looking at you. Luke, we will watch the movie. While we unpack in our brand new house, we will put Rudy on and we will watch... This movie, um, you know, the, Jesus is going, in the time that we find Jesus, Jesus is going back home, and he's in Nazareth, and none of his family, and none of his friends, and none of his community believe he is who he says he is. They, they don't believe that he has this call on his life. They don't believe that he's the son of God. They say all this stuff that puts doubt in the minds of others as it pertains to who Jesus is and what he's called to do and who he's called to be, namely the son of God, the Messiah who's come to take away the sins of the world. And so here's, here's the comfort that I get from this is because I don't know about you, but I know about me, and hopefully this speaks to you. There have been plenty of times in my life where people around me have, um, have discouraged me from my call and what I've been given to do and who I believe God has equipped me to be and is equipping me to be and formed me to be. And there were very few people in my life growing up who actually spoke destiny and saw things in me and encouraged that. But there was also a ton of people in my life. Like I, I can think about several people, like I could rattle it off, teachers, peers, family that, that spoke things into my life that were so contrary to where God has me now. God has me now. And Jesus, where, where I'm comforted in that, is that the Son of God himself, who is baptized in the Jordan River, who hears the voice of his Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's led to overcome the enemy in the wilderness, and he's doing all this missional work. He's laying hands on people. He's healing the sick. He's teaching about the kingdom of God. He's doing all these things, and yet when he goes back home, there's people who are bringing doubt and questioning and discouragement to who he is. They're his closest people. His community are trying to throw him from his calling. Isn't that crazy? But I'm encouraged because we know that Jesus continues in his ministry. He continues in his purpose. He continues as who God has created to me, or created, created him to be. He has continued in his calling. And so that's an encouragement to me because doubt comes constantly and discouragement comes constantly and people push against you constantly, and people have a lot to say about you constantly. But as long as you maintain the truth of who Jesus says you are, who God says you are, then we take heart because Jesus wasn't thrown from his calling. And if there's anybody, anybody in this world that has undeniable proof about who they are and what they came to do, it was Jesus. Because I don't know the last time I was able to just lay hands on somebody and immediately they're healed of their leprosy. I don't know the last time where I'm able to touch somebody and their withered hand is extended and uh, made brand new. I don't know the last time somebody just tugged on the hem of my shirt and the hemorrhaging of blood stopped, the flow of blood stopped. I don't know the last time I was able to take a dead girl 
by the hand and say, Talitha kum, and she rose up and then fed her a sandwich. I don't know the last time I did all that. And if I was able to do that, I wonder if there would be people around me that go, yeah, man, that dude is something different. That, and, and I'm going to follow him. And I wonder if Jesus was doing that in the flesh. In my, I wonder if I would look at him and say, that really is the son of God. Or would I be somebody that would be like, um, isn't this the guy from Nazareth? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the guy who came from nothing? Is, isn't this the guy where nothing good could come out of the place that he's, that we're from? Nothing good comes out of here. He can't be the son of God. What would be my response? So if Jesus is getting all that questioning in his life, all that doubt from the people around him, then who am I to think that I'm not going to be getting the same thing with the little thing that I've been given? I gotta have faith to maintain the little thing that I've been given. I have to have faith to know that even through the wilderness and through the dry seasons and through the desert and when things feel like really bad or nothing's going up, I gotta maintain, no, this is who God says I am, even though maybe in my environment and the people I'm around, maybe that's saying something counter to what I know God has said about me. And I know a lot of people that have been thrown from their faith in God because they've given themselves to the ideas of the people around them and the circumstances they find them themselves in and we can't do that because if there was no question about who Jesus is it was undeniable miracle worker son of God word with flesh if people were denying that if people were doubting that then who are you not to be doubted who are you not to be denied but we maintain faith because we know that the only word that carries any weight is the word of God and what it says about you and me. And so we maintain that faith. And we say, no, Jesus, the son of God, who is doubted by everyone around him, those closest to him, even his family, maintained faith to keep his trust in God, to maintain his identity and who he was and said, I'm going to continue and finish the race. I'm going to finish this thing because it's what God's called me to. So if God has called me to this mission and God has called me to this person or purpose and God has called me as this person and I am his child, then that needs to certainly carry so much more weight than the word of some people around me and what they have to say. Whose word carries more weight in your life? The word of God or the word of people? The word that stands forever, the, the, the f- grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Does that word carry weight in your life? Or is it the fleeting, indecisive, uh, going with the wind to and fro, uh, inconsistent word of people in your life? What carries more weight to you? Because for me, it's got to be God's word. Or I would have been out decades ago. It's got to be the word of God. Or I would have given up yesterday. It's got to be God's word. Or I have no hope for my future. Because if I put my destiny in the hands of my own ideas and my own insufficiencies and insecurities, and not to mention the, the discouragement that the people have for me outside of myself, if I give myself to that, I won't make it. And neither will you. You're doomed if you don't know who God is and who he's created you to be and who your savior is and what he faced and how he continued to press on for the joy set before him, obedience to his father's will and you. So in Mark chapter six, verse one, we okay? Okay. (laughs) In Mark chapter six, verse one, it says this. says this Jesus went out from there and this is going out from the place where he healed Jairus's daughter Jesus went from there and came into his hometown that's Nazareth can anything good come from Nazareth and his disciples followed him and when the Sabbath came he began to teach in the synagogue and the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man learn these things? Where did this man learn these things? And what is this wisdom that has been given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. 
It's amazing. What's up with this knowledge and this wisdom and these miracles? What's up with this knowledge and this wisdom and these miracles? Is this not the carpenter? That word there uh, actually means stone mason, that Jesus was more like a stone mason than he was like a, a, a framer that used wood materials, more like a, like a mason. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are his sisters not here with us? Got a big family. And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could not do any miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. So here we have Jesus in his hometown. He's teaching at the synagogue. He's performed some miracles. His reputation has preceded him. And in this space, there are many listeners. And the many listeners in his hometown, this, this was um, not a large area. There was not many people a part of this hometown. It was a, Nazareth was a small community. Everybody knew everybody. This is the small town, you know. This is the small town where everybody knows everybody. Every, there's one church in this small town. There's one road in this small town. This is a small town that everybody knows everybody, and everybody talks about everybody's business, and everybody's, you know, out there. They're, they're, they're washing their clothes together. They're drawing their water together. They're doing everything together, and, and some of them have jobs, specialty jobs, jobs, areas of specialty when it comes to their work. And so Jesus was a carpenter, most likely with his father, Joseph, who was a carpenter. And they most likely had this sort of put my hands to the work and let me help people with their houses and this and that. So he was known as somebody who was a carpenter, somebody who worked with stone and helped people create their dwellings. And that's how he made his living. That's a dirty job. That's a, that's, a, that's a type of job where Mike Rowe, do you remember dirty jobs with Mike Rowe? He, he's going to go and he's going to get dirty with Jesus. You know what I mean? He's going to get dirty with Jesus and they're going to uh, do this kind of archaic first century type of stone masonry and build these dwelling places like there's not much bath water and soap and deodorant around. This is a dirty job. Mike Rowe would love this dirty job. But this is where Jesus, this is how Jesus is seen. Isn't this a man who is blue collar, works with his hands, don't we know this guy? Don't we know his family? Don't we know where he comes from? Like, what is this teaching we're hearing? What is this wisdom that he has? What are these miracles that he's working? Who is this guy? Because we know this guy. We, we know Jesus. We watched him grow up. We hired him for jobs. And now he's instructing us. And it's a marvelous thing. It's an amazing thing. Like, he knows so much. Now, we know he didn't study under anybody special. We know he wasn't studying under Gamaliel and all these uh, uh, super righteous religious leaders. He's from Nazareth. Where did he get this knowledge? Where did he get this wisdom? What are these miracles being worked through here? We know his brothers and sisters, by the way, they don't believe he's the Messiah. Like, it took James, Jesus being crucified and being resurrected before he even believed that Jesus was the Son of God. Remember when we talked about Jesus healing the paralytic that was lowered through the roof and, and his brothers and sisters were outside telling people that Jesus has lost his mind. It was earlier on in the chapters we've read in Mark. Oh, he's, he's lost his mind. He, can, can you bring him out so we can bring him home? He, he's going a little crazy. He, they're apologizing and defending Jesus and the work that he's doing. His family isn't even convinced he is who he says he is. All right, you're the son of God. I'm the pope. Or better yet, I'm going to go play for Notre Dame. That's you. That's your call. 
they were amazed that he had this teaching, knowing where he came from, knowing who he was. It, 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 it was uh, these, these questions that were continued to, to be wrapped in scandal. Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this Mary's son? Like, like that question was not a common uh, a question, a common connection, except for that which would be offensive. To identify a son in this context with his mother as the parental is actually offensive. Isn't this Mary's son? What about, isn't this Joseph's son? Why wouldn't they say, isn't this the son of Joseph? Why are they saying, isn't this Mary's son? And many scholars and theologians say that, no, they're saying, isn't this Mary's son as a degrading uh, identifier because Mary's pregnancy was wrapped in scandal. Joseph wanted to divorce her, and so they're connecting Jesus to be a child of illegitimacy. That isn't she the one that got pregnant out of wedlock? Isn't this Mary's child? They say nothing about his father. And that would be something that would be offensive back then. This is a child of scandal. We know this guy. He's a blue-collar stonemason working with his hands who comes from nowhere where nothing good can come out of. And he's got all these brothers and sisters who don't know anything about him or don't think anything good about him. And, oh, by the way, he doesn't even know who his daddy is. And neither do we. Like, this is a scandalous situation and he's teaching at the synagogue and they're saying what knowledge what wisdom what miracles so 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 they they have this awe and wonder at the teachings and wisdom and miracles of Jesus but they don't have any regard for the truth of who he is because they have connected too much about what they know about themselves and this place and the people around him that it's veiling them being able to see him for who he tr truly is. And I think that's a, that's a warning for the church that so often there can be an association made where we look at the church, we look at the community, we look at the people that are close to Jesus, but oftentimes we can begin to make an association about who Jesus is based on the people that we mix it up with, that are around Jesus. There are people that are making determinations about who Jesus is based on how you and I are living our lives. There are people that are making determinations about Jesus based on who you and I say he is. There are people that make determinations about Jesus saying, no, he's, he was full of wisdom. He was full of knowledge. He worked great miracles. But when the push comes to shove and they get around people and they see that I'm not even so sure that these people have faith in Jesus being the son of God. I'm not so sure these people see themselves as a, a brother or sister of Jesus that has been brought into the family of God who are called to reflect who Jesus is. And so that is a determinant of my own faith because you don't have the faith that says Jesus is Lord of my life and Savior, and we're not living to reflect that truth. Many people make determinations based on what they experience from you and I. I don't know if that's been your story, but it's been mine. It, it, the, 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 the temptation for that to be true is evident in my own life. I've been in church for a while. I've, I've been around People who say they know Jesus from all different dy dynamics and cultures and all different socioeconomic status, all different places. And my faith gets tested sometimes because Christ followers who say they follow Jesus are ungracious or judgmental or lazy or, or mean or stingy. Like I can make determinations or they can make judgments against me. Like when I was just first believing in Jesus, man, I, I am so grateful that the person that took me into their home for small group to do small group every week 
accepted me coming into their house for small group and were patient with me because I was saying all sorts of crazy things coming out of the world. I was covered with tattoos. I was coming in there talking crazy, not knowing anything about the Lord, saying outlandish statements and all these things, judging people, thinking I knew something when I didn't. And they were patient and gracious with me. And it built my faith and sanctified me in a way where I was able to learn about Jesus, no more about him because the people that were in proximity to Jesus and in his family had a faith that inspired me to grow, right? But we've also been in circles where it's like, I don't think I want that. I don't even think, I don't even know if they know Jesus. They know his word. They, they are knowledgeable. They may come off as wise. They, they can profess to the miracles, but I'm not so sure they truly know who Jesus is. And I think it's important for us to know who Jesus is, to take him at his word, step into the truth of Jesus, knowing who Jesus is in your life and reflecting the character of Jesus through uh, reflecting the character of Jesus in the church and outside of the church, being a reflection of who Jesus is because even if we can be mature enough to say that your faith doesn't determine mine. We can be mature enough to do that. There are people who are wondering about Jesus and they are, uh, and they are looking at our witness to help them in their faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just because somebody's faith isn't a determinant of mine because I'm mature in Christ and I know who he is and I know who I am doesn't mean that other people Aren't, it doesn't mean that other people's faith isn't being determined by your witness. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we have to be careful of faith by association. We, we've heard um, the phrase church hurt. All the t- we hear that all the time, how, how we've been church hurt. And I walked away from God because I was hurting the church. And it's like, dude, if, if anything, this shows me because the disciples were there. And they were in Jesus' hometown, and many people did not believe, and yet the disciples continued to follow Jesus. They were not allowing how people were responding to Jesus to determine how much they would put their faith in Jesus and following him. And, and there's, there's times where, where we can look at these organizations, entities, or communities, and, and, and we can be hurt by that. And then we can walk away and discontinue following Jesus because people, flawed people, gave us a flawed representation of who Jesus is. And so that we decided that Jesus was no good because they didn't reflect him in a proper light. And so now I'm walking alone. I'm walking without Jesus I'm walking away with the church. I'm walking away from God. And that's not what happened here. The the thing that happened here was that Jesus couldn't perform many miracles in his hometown because people didn't believe. And then when he continued to walk in his missional journey to, to reveal to the world what the kingdom of God was like, the disciples continued to follow him. And so it was so important for them to place the stake of their faith in the person of Jesus and not what people had to say about Jesus. It's important that they would own their faith and take responsibility for their own faith because many times when we walk away from the church, we're placing our faith in the hands of someone else and and they they aren't created to be responsible for your faith. To, 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 to take my, my faith and to put it in the hands of Kelly or to put it in the hands of Danielle or to put it in the hands of David and say, okay, so my faith, the measure of my faith that I'm going to maintain in Jesus is dependent on you getting it right always and you not hurting me and you not disappointing me. Like, I can't hold you responsible for my faith in my personal relationship with Jesus. And so we have to maintain that, that my faith in Jesus is my responsibility. And, and my faith in Jesus is determined by how, how, the way in which I choose to walk with Jesus in a relationship. I continue to follow Jesus. If the disciples listened to the words of the people that Mark took note of while they were in Jesus' hometown, if the disciples had listened they would have been doomed. And we wouldn't even have these gospels. We wouldn't even have these epistles from these men. We wouldn't have them. 
because they would listen to all the voices of all the people that knew about all the baggage surrounding Jesus. And they said, no way, he can't be the one. He can't be the one. But doubt is something that we see often in in the Bible. People questioning, is he really who he says he is? Can he really do what he says he can do? Is he really the one who is to come? Uh, John the Baptist, who Jesus notes is like the most righteous man. Like he he was the, the voice in the wilderness crying out, here comes the Lord. Make way, make way, make ready, make ready. The way of the Lord, repent and turn to God. He he was the one that was baptizing people in the truth that the Messiah was going to come. And and Jesus comes and John baptizes him. And then in the events surrounding where we find ourselves in Mark, John the Baptist is uh, is arrested. His head is soon going to come off his body. He's going to be beheaded soon while he's in prison. And while he's in prison and he knows that his life is in jeopardy, he sends a message to Jesus saying, are you really the one who we've been waiting for or should we be waiting for someone else? Are you truly the one who we've been waiting for or, or should be, we be looking for someone else? John is in this prison cell and he's doubting because, listen, if if he was the one heralding and and, and proclaiming the coming of Jesus and Jesus comes and and then John is looking at Jesus as the one that's going to like restore all things and restore the kingdom of Israel and things are going to be great and we're going to be eating steak. But now I'm in a prison I'm in a prison and I've been giving my life to proclaiming the coming of Jesus. I'm in a prison now and now I'm at risk of losing my head. This is not good. And so he sends word out and he says, are you really him who we were waiting for? He's in this place where his environment and his circumstances are are screaming in his ears and heart that if Jesus truly was the one who was to come, then why am I in this prison fearing for my life? Why am I here? That, that, that sort of circumstance could have certainly uh, threw John from his calling. But the amazing thing is in the other Gospels, John continues to maintain his, his identity and maintain his purpose because he's speaking truth to the king so much so that it's messing things all up and then they actually do go for his head. But Jesus sends word back And Jesus replies to the servants in Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, after John says, should we be waiting for someone else? Are you really him? And Jesus says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. John, you'll, bless, you'll be blessed if I'm not a stumbling block. You'll be blessed if these things are not a stumbling block to you and you maintain the faith that I am who I say I am. You maintain the faith that I am worthy of you following. I, I am the Messiah. I am the one that you are unworthy of untying my, my sandals. I am the one that you baptized. I am the one that you heard the voice of the Father audibly saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I am the one that you visually saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. I am the one. I am the son of God. And so he says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And all the people that were in close proximity to him in the town of Nazareth in his own town are stumbling. And not even so much on account of him, but on account of themselves. They've seen so much that is creating a stumbling block. The son of God couldn't come as a carpenter. The son of God couldn't come through Mary. The son of God couldn't come out of Nazareth. Who is this? And it's the whole message of Jesus. It's the whole message of the Gospels. It's the whole narrative of biblical history that Jesus uses the low things of the world to confound the high things, the humble things of the world to confound the proud, the the weak things of the world to confound the strong. He he uses the the foolish things of the world to confound the, the wise. This is what God does in his upside down kingdom. Of course, the Savior would come from a place like Nazareth. Of course, he would be a blue-collar stone-working man. Of course, he would be this guy. Of course, he would be in a place out of nothing. 
And of course, it would be this one who would redeem us and save us. It's so crazy because you think about the proximity of, of these relatives who had been walking with Jesus at this, who had been with Jesus in their hometown for over 30 years years or so as he was growing up. And then the disciples at this point have been walking with him maybe up to a couple years. And you just think about like the proximity of Jesus to people and then their belief in him at the same time. So like the ones, if you think about it in this like TP, it's like the ones that were closest to him had little faith in who he was. And then he has disciples with him who have been walking with him. As the funnel kind of gets bigger, the TP kind of grows toward the bottom. And in the middle, you have these disciples who have been walking with him with a, for a couple years, and they're still wondering who he is. They're not exactly sure. Remember, who is this then that the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this guy? I want to know more about this guy. And then you have a demoniac at the bottom where the funnel even widens, and, and that, that would be the progression of faith, the, the bigness of faith at the bottom. You have a demoniac that couldn't be farther from him, and he's bowing at his feet saying and worshiping him. What would you have to do with us, son of the most high God? It's like those who were closest to Jesus had the smallest faith in him. And then as the funnel kind of the TP grows down at the bottom, the one that was farthest from Jesus had the most faith in him. And that's where he says, a prophet is not welcome and is not without dishonor except in his hometown. Those who just connect so much baggage to their upbringing, they won't get them. I don't know if that's true for you. Sometimes it's like my own family doesn't really get me. All these, all these people do, but, but I feel like my, the people closest to me don't even get me. Uh, they, they are always questioning who I am and they're being critical and the mistakes that I'm making and they, they connect all this baggage or my friends from my past or whatever. It's kind of like, but then you walk into kind of the new place and you find, you know, the family and uh, that, the community that we're with and you're like, man, I, I feel pretty understood here. <laughs> you know, it's wild. But... I think that's why Jesus instructs us to be sure that we come to him like a little child. Because you can have family members that were like so messed up when you were a kid. You know, like that uncle that came for Thanksgiving or whatever, and they were the coolest uncle ever. And you just like, love, they were like exciting and they were cool. And you were like, man, like, Uncle Jesse, you know, full house. Like, Uncle Jesse, he's got great hair. He loves rock and roll. Like, he, you know, and he pops in and, like, picks you up and throws you around and stuff. But, like, but you're not connecting, like, any of the baggage <laughs> of his life because you're just like, wow, it's him. You know, it's like that kind of faith. And I, I think it's important. And that's why Jesus says, like, hey, have that childlike faith. You know, have that childlike faith where you're not making any assumptions. You, you, you just want to be loved. And Jesus is like, I'm the one who's come to love you. Love you in the way that you've been created to be loved. And maintain that childlike faith because then we start to dig and we start to have things throw us from our faith. And we start to listen to people around us and who they say Jesus is. And it starts to throw us from our faith. And then we start to lose that childlike faith because all these ideas and all these implications around us start to veil us about who Jesus is, the hard stuff that we might find ourselves in. Like John the Baptist, who's in prison. And he's like, are you really him? So many things can throw us from our faith in trusting Jesus. But if we look at the life of the disciples, we see he is who he says he is. He's done what he says he's done. He'll do what he says he's going to do. I'm going to close with this. that in the life of Jesus too, we see here that oftentimes it doesn't matter how much we're willing to pour, pour out. Oftentimes it doesn't matter how generous we're being. Oftentimes it doesn't, it doesn't matter how gracious we are or how forgiving or how much we've moved on, or how much we've come close. Sometimes it, it doesn't matter how much 
we continue to give of ourselves and being a reflection of Jesus. Sometimes that doesn't matter so much because we may do all that and people may still not receive you and people may still not forgive you and people may still uh, uh, hurt you and people may still leave you and people may still reject you. Right. And when I when I see the life of Jesus, I go, wow, this guy healed and he preached and he had wisdom and he met with and he sat with and he wanted to be with. And they ultimately were like, no, we don't want it. And, and we could in, internalize that. Jesus could internalize that being the, the that, that human part of him could certainly internalize that because I know the human part of me, my humanness. I go, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Like. Why don't they want me? And, and, and if you have issues or trauma connected to, like, rejection issues and stuff like that, like, it could really play. What's wrong with me? Why don't they want me? Why, why don't they love me? You know, those things. And, and, and you can internalize that, and it could be to the real detriment of who you are and your faith and who God's created you to be. And so... I just want to encourage you and say you can't control the way that people receive you. And you can't control the way that people respond to you. And you can't control the way or that people are going to leave you or walk out on you. You can't, you can't control that. And you, and you might try really hard to control that. But when I look at the story of Jesus, it's not like Jesus was chasing them down, going, please love me. Please believe me. Please stay with me. I want to build this thing. No, he moved on with his 12 disciples, knowing the truth of who he was. And he trusted that. And he aimed only to please God. He wasn't going to try to control the response of all these people that he was trying to love and try to reveal himself to. He wasn't going to continually exhaust himself and exasperate themselves that they might exasperate himself that they might believe in him. No, he was just going to continue to do what God's called him to do and leave the rest to God. And sometimes we want so much to be embraced and we want so much for things to be settled and we want so much for people to meet us halfway and to be gracious we want that but God is looking at you and that's who we aim to please and that's who we're motivated by and that's who we're obedient to we say God I don't I can't have any control about the response of others but I do have a control over who you've called me to be. And I'm going to maintain that I'm a child of God, that I'm a peacemaker, that I'm an agent of grace, that I'm a follower of Jesus, that I know who I am and I know who Jesus is. And so I'm going to aim to please God. And that is enough for God. Amen. That's all I got today. And uh, I do hope... Um, I do hope to see you on Tuesday. Uh, I do hope that you make every effort to come out. And if you could, um, make every effort to be on time um, because we're going to start right at 7. So do make every effort to be on time. And uh, I look forward to worshiping and praying and casting some vision and working through some things with you. And, um, and I think God has big things in store for us if we're able to receive what he has for us on Tuesday evening. Okay? Um, so uh, stand for a benediction, and then uh, and we'll dismiss. Family, Isaiah 60, verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Family, I pray that you do rise and shine this week knowing who your father is, that your light has come in Jesus and that his glory does rise upon you. No matter what people might say around you, no matter what your circumstances might implicate, your light has come and so you rise and shine knowing who Jesus is, knowing who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.